Before we talk about the activities of the WWE this weekend, let's talk about the biography of Mr. DiBiase, Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man. You saw this program last week on the A&E Network, did you not, Brian Last? I did. I saw it. I enjoyed it. He's a very pleasant man. A <laughs> very pleasant man. He just man. seems very happy. And, you know, if you don't mention any of the state scandals in Mississippi, he seems like a very... <laughs> Well together, you know, put well me mentally together guy. A well, well, not, together, unlike me, but, unlike, oh. unlike this here, me, you. <laughs> this is biography, DiBiase, the million now, dollar Ted. Nouns and pronouns, adjectives. Um, I would, I mean, I'm not saying this to knock Ted, I was disappointed in it. I was disappointed in it because one of the, we, the, I like Ted. That's why I was disappointed because the main part of the his career that I liked, that I just wanted to see maybe five, six, seven minutes of footage or, you know, uh, attention out of the hour given to, they completely skipped the fuck over. It, it, it the period from what nineteen eighty one to nineteen eighty seven, it just they they kind of told it. In that, yeah, he went, he started in the old Mid South of the McGurk Territory, the Louisiana. He worked in Texas, went to work for Vince in 1978, which I think, I think it was 78, 79, had a run. Uh, goes to Georgia or whatever, does something else, and oh, Vince has an idea. And then Vince I mean, met yeah. Bruce. That's what the documentary made it seem. Well, yeah, yeah, it, well, yeah, and. Well, let's face it, Bruce had everybody's phone number, so technically, that's, uh, but nevertheless, the period of time where he, they established that he was well thought of from the beginning and and got some, you know, early notoriety, and then completely skipped over when he was the the best worker in the Mid-South Territory as a baby face and as a, a heel. Uh, the the a, a big run in Georgia, the UWF transition, and he was a major player at that point. It, just everything that happened from the period of time where he really started getting over to where he became the million dollar man. Yeah, man, it was a good story to tell there, even if you kind of wanted to minimize it. It could be I went to, I returned to Mid South as the biggest heel in the territory, and then. You could show the angle with Flair and Murdoch and explain how that turned him into the biggest baby face in the territory. They didn't even show any of that. I mean, that's the one thing everyone yeah. thinks about with Mid-South. The stuff with the dog and the stuff with him and Murdoch. Or the match with him and Flair and the Murdoch incident, I should say. Yeah, and you know what I'm not saying? I know that they only had 46 minutes plus commercials or whatever, so they couldn't focus on individual feuds or angles or whatever. They could have showed some highlights of that. But the, to skip over an entire six-year period where he... Yes, they basically ended up with him... How did they, how did they phrase it? Being passed by for the NWA title, which was back in 1981 again. And he was kind of upset. So, and then Vince called 87, boom. The, his best years as Ted DiBiase pre million dollar man were those. And that's kind of stuff I was just wanting to see on the national television. So that's why I was kind of disappointed. Not in that Ted was not a great talent or I, I don't just, you know, didn't like the the program, although they get a lot to the to the preaching after after his in ring career was over with. So, but it was cool seeing the 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 childhood pictures because he, they raised the the great point at the beginning of all the second generation talent. How many actually their mother and father? We're both wrestlers, and we get the you know a baby doll, and help me. Besides, DiBiase here. There's got to be a luchador or two that we're not thinking of. I don't. That's a tough question. Mother so and we, father. We will we'll re, we'll research it and get back to you if we come up with anything, but. And then both his mother and real father were in show business 
before that wrestling even became a thing, she was a a dancer and his father was a, a singer. But they got divorced when he was like two years old. They had some great old pictures there. And then Helen Hild, his mother, married, who worked in the 50s, and you see her name everywhere. She was a, you know, a, you know, a name female wrestler in that era that traveled almost all the, the territories. And she married uh, Mike DiBiase, who was a, big name, especially in Texas, and had been a AAU. The AAU was before the NCAA, correct? They predate that organization. But he had been a, a major collegiate shooter and then a name pro wrestler. Did he not hold the junior heavyweight title at some point? You know, I'm not sure. It sounds right. I know Ed Francis had the world junior heavyweight title in the 50s. I got to see what Mike DiBiase would have had. Or it may have been regional, but nevertheless, uh, they had some black and white footage of Iron Mike and and then tell the story. It was July of 1969. He had a heart attack after a match in Lubbock. And when he died, that's I think this was a great, I think the best part, the highlight of the show was illustrating the the relationship that DBI, Mike DiBiase had had with Dory Funk Sr. and and the Funk family and the what the Funks did for Ted is a result of their, you know, they liked him also, but their respect for Mike DiBiase. You know, Dory Sr.'s wife was the one who called Ted out in the hallway when they all came over to the house and told him what had happened to his father. And Terry is the one who brought his dad's ring bag back to him. So that was, you know, Ted was only, I think, what he said, 14 or 15 at that point, so it wasn't like Ted was ever in the business. They just knew he was Mike DiBiase's son. And it was, you know, it was moving to hear him tell that story. But you could see just in that brief story being told here and Terry Funk's own words telling it, why Terry was so revered by everyone who worked there. Yeah. Forget about everywhere else and fans like us. When people work for West Texas, they didn't come out of there complaining like, oh, the fucking promoter's kids. None of that. And Terry really did look after Ted DiBiase. Like, there was a genuineness beyond the craziness that every wrestler had that Terry Funk never lost. Thank you. That that's very profound. I was waiting for more. Um but yeah, that's uh, you know, they had thankfully comments from Terry that they'd recorded, you know, years ago, probably when he did the Hall of Fame thing or whatever. But um talking about Ted and it, it, Terry played an instrumental part in in at certain points in his life including getting him getting him to New York and getting him to Georgia and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but it, it was interesting that he had a pause in it. Ted had a pause in his life where he moved to Arizona with his grandmother and he wanted to play football in college, but he hadn't watched wrestling in since his father had died. And now he's gone to college. So three or four years or whatever. And he saw one of the funk shows from, the TV from Amarillo, but they were bringing a house show to Tucson. So he went to visit and ended up switching. And instead of going to Arizona to play football, he went to West Texas state so he could eventually work for the Funks. So that was, uh, you can tell they probably made an impression on him at night and gave him a good, I mean, I'm sure he wanted to do it to begin with, but they also probably gave him a good assurance that, uh, yeah, this is the thing you need to do. You know, again, he didn't have too many people in that kind of role. I'm not saying Terry Funk was a father figure. He was, you know, maybe an older brother that could look after him. He knew he would be okay under the Funks in West Texas. Well, and see, that's when Dory Sr. was still alive. Think about it, because he, um, Ted was already, he had, he didn't go back to his last, uh, year of college and he 
started in 1974, so he would have, he may even have, have talked to the old man himself there that night. Because that would have been, what, 1972 or whatever. So he would have had, you know, the, the, some of the most important and knowledgeable guys in the business, you know, taking him under their wing, which is why he probably turned out to be, you know, such a, gay, a great worker and he had the aptitude and he had the eye for it. And a lot of the, the guys that were either trained in West Texas or came, spent a lot of time in that system, ever from, you know, the Saruta to, uh, Dick Murdoch to the guys that uh, the Funks trained for on and off for Japan or DiBiase here, they were all so fundamentally sound, as Gordon Soley might used to say. And they were just all around excellent workers who understood the flow of the fucking match. But anyway, that's, you know, they, they tell that story up to that point. And then he debuts in Lubbock in 1974, the same town that his dad had died in. And then they sent him to work what was the McGurk territory. It wasn't Mid-South Wrestling. Right, they called it Mid-South. At that point. But, they, but for the sake of... I can see why for the sake of, of clarity for the average viewer... That they did that, but yeah, it was but actually still, come on. It's like if you work for Continental and you call it Smoky Mountain. Well, but there you go. You got me there. But still, the point is, it was it was, and actually, it wasn't really all mid south though yet because they sent him to Louisiana and Mississippi, and Arkansas, and he didn't have uh, and and Oklahoma. He didn't have Houston yet. Blah blah blah. But nevertheless, that's where Ted spent. Oh, if he went there, it was spent, you know, probably eight of the next 12 years because he was so good at that. It was a really a, a, a territory where the baby faces and the heels need to have their shit together. And he was so good at both first as a baby face. And he finally got to turn heel there and, you know, learn from. Uh, not only Watts, but all the, the Dusties and all the top guys that came through there. And between, that's why I would... Go ahead. Between 76 and 86, how many wrestlers put more miles on their car than Ted DiBiase? Oh, God. How many cars? I don't know he had to have gone through in that point in time. And that's why he said it. He told me at one point when he was in Louisiana in 84, some of the later part of the year while we were still there, and you can see we were kind of dragging, and he said, hey, I was here one time for a year and a half. My hair started falling out, and I hated the business. I had to get out of here for a while. But then he'd come back because the the money and, you know, you could you could not only make money there, but you could establish yourself as a top guy, and he was always considered a main eventer there. And if, if he left and he came back, he was... Right on top. But that period of time, then he was working St. Louis and, you know, being being brought in there. And his first run in the W, was it WWWF still when he got there the first time or had yes. they switched to WWF? I think it was still the extra W when he first got there. And, you know, it, you could tell that he, he was a little pale and... and Ted was never a muscular man. He was like Bobby Eaton. He didn't have a lot of muscular definition, but his cardio was through the roof. But you could tell he didn't kind of fit in with it without a gimmick in the WWF from the highlights they showed. But he worked everywhere else because he was such a a, a good, solid baby face that could sell and understood what was going on, and they were already you know, talking about potentially, you know, him being the next champion. I think by 1981, what was it? That's where Funk said, don't go back to Texas, go to Georgia, meaning get on the TV there, TBS. You need people to see you because they were talking about him being one of the next champions for the NWA. And Terry would know that because by then, you know, it was Terry and Dory that, well, they had... They were booking for Baba, the Americans, and 
They still had membership in the NWA. I think that by that point in time, they'd sold Amarillo, but you know what? They knew what was going on. And by the way, let me just clarify. I was wrong. It was WWF when he got there in 79. When did they switch? In 78 then? In 79. That's what threw me, When you oh. said 78, that's what threw me off. 79 is when they switched. He gets there as the North American champion. Uh. And then he feuds with Pat Patterson. And all of a sudden they announced Pat Patterson won a tournament in Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> and he's now the Intercontinental Champion. That's right. And I got pictures of DiBiase with the North American title belt from Frank Amato. Do you remember that photographer? Yeah, of course. Everybody does, because he would write in black Sharpie his last name, Amato, across the corner of every picture he ever took on the front. He wasn't the only one. Lil Al Vavasor had a stamp that he put on everything. What are your thoughts as a photographer on for other photographers that would... Mar, deface, vandalize their photos? Well, that would put a stamp on there or something to let the world know it's their photo. Well, see, it was harder to steal shit in those days anyway. So the kids wouldn't understand what we were talking about because now they got the watermark online. But you can make a digital copy of anything. The, to, to steal someone else's picture on a grand scale in the 1970s, you had to take a decently clear picture to a photo place and have a copy negative made off of that picture, which wasn't going to look as good as the picture did, and then have copies made off of that. That was the way the procedure worked. So you were just, if you were stealing somebody's picture, you were being a complete prick because everybody could tell that it was a copy of a fucking picture. And it looked like shit, so most people wouldn't want it. So... A lot of them, you know, put their names on the back of the pictures so they couldn't get printed in magazines without credit. But uh, some people would write their name on the front of the fucking picture, which I thought was cheesy because, God damn it, somebody wants the picture to put on their wall. They don't want your, unless they felt like it was their autograph because they were celebrities. But I'm digressing, aren't I? That's what this show's all about. You know, the digressions are sometimes better than the transgressions or the progressions. They didn't talk about any of Ted's transgressions in terms of the Mississippi state government and... Oh, come on now, you keep going back to Mississippi. The ghosts of Mississippi. Let the fucking ghosts of Mississippi lay. That's what they're calling those tax dollars. The ghosts of Mississippi. That money just vanished. (laughs) They they would... off into the night Woo, the now, money what do you think though of uh you know getting to the wwf portion here and again bruce plays a big part of that because that's right when he got there and maybe one of the things that helped sell him to vince is someone who could uh, be a complete stooge <laughs> what did you think of seeing you, you were the- looking for the word toady uh, i was thinking toady but i decided to go a different route what did you think seeing the vignettes and some of the very briefly some of the behind the scenes of the early million dollar mad ted dibiase vignettes we always hear i think it was the scott hall biography where they said yeah this was a big thing for vince he was on hand producing it himself same thing with the million dollar man well i'm gonna be in the minority the million dollar man was not my favorite ted dibiase as i as i pretty much mentioned before my favorite ted dibiase was when he was a serious baby face on top and a serious heel on top in that early to mid 80s period when he had that deep voice and he cut the fucking convincing promo and his work the matches um but now having said that i recognize that he made more money with the million dollar man and that's what everybody remembers And I liked him in a lot of cases as the million dollar man. Again, in the ring, it was still Ted DiBiase. But I thought so much of the, so much of the vignettes were, it was over the top. I know that's what everybody was doing in the WWF at that point in time. But the laugh, it was, (laughs) it was, it, Bring it back, and and that's the thing. Bruce loves to say the phrase, well, we wanted to create this character. And they're all trying to self-fillate themselves like they're in the actor's studio. 
that he can't just come out and say, you know, we wanted the gimmick to be he's a fucking multi-millionaire. <laughs> we wanted to create this character. Uh, and, uh, you know, it worked because he could work and he could talk and he could pull the shit off, but it was Vince's you because it was Vince's alter ego. It was Vince's personal gimmick that he came up with. Tony Khan comes up with, what's his name, Hologram, and Vince came up with a Million Dollar Man. And, but, and he did produce everything, but also Ted was taking it and running with it. If but it was, that's if, why. If it was Tony, it would be the boy with all the friends. Yeah, there you go. The, the, the friended boy. The boy with too many friends. How many friends? <laughs> too many he, friends. <laughs> too many friends. Uh, but, the, but because of that, it was over the top corny in a lot of cases with what they put on television. And I know Ted got a kick out of it and Bruce got a kick out of everybody, but I'm like, ah, he was more effective when he could really fucking dig into it. And you believed it, but nevertheless, that just the laughing in the, some of the over the top of I'm not talking about the general heel kicking the basketball out of the kids dribble or what, by the way, that was Virgil's son, I believe, but they never mentioned that on this show. Uh, but anyway, they they the vignettes are what people remember. And at the same time, Vince, because this was his thing, actually, the stories are legendary, did fly him first class and paid for limousines and had him stay in the best hotel and gave him cash to fucking tip $100 bills to keep the gimmick up. And it, 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 it's a, if it had been somebody like the Ultimate Warrior that had got that deal and was even been being because even warrior didn't get goddamn tip money from Vince, right? The, the boys probably would have fucking killed him and buried him under a dam somewhere. But because they respected Ted and his ability, they go, well, you lucky son of a bitch. It was that kind of thing. Um, but did this, this was another thing that bothered me. But I guess it would have been it, it would it have been confusing after all. They they covered the February 1998 NBC main event that was prime time on Friday night. What? 88. I said February 88. You said 98. Well, that's the old 98 used to come round the bend. <laughs> that, what that, is? that was the old 98. I was ducking out of the way of it. <laughs> February of 88 is, is before I got on the train. It was a Friday night, wasn't it? Friday night at like 8 o'clock. That's right, Friday night. The uh, main, it was the main event, not Saturday night's main event. Well, NBC main event. The NBC main event. Whatever the fuck it was. Anyway, that was where they did the twin referee deal, but they cut out the twin referees, what I'm trying to say to you. And it was, they were talking about Ted wanted to buy the WWF title from Andre after Andre beat Hulk, which was the rematch from the previous year's WrestleMania. That's why it drew, what was the viewership? Like 33 million viewers? Something like that. Biggest audience ever for professional wrestling. Yeah, it, it was the first primetime network wrestling program since the Dumont network had gone under in 1956 and it was the highest rated wrestling program ever in the United States. And so it was also when they signed, cause I remember seeing it going, Oh my God, that's fucking Earl. Cause Earl had been working for us at Crockett up until the, you know, like the previous fucking day. And suddenly they did the twin referee but they didn't show that. They just, that Ted bought the referee off or whatever. And couldn't they have, couldn't they have said that Ted paid? Cause that's what they said on the show, right? Was it by God, did DiBiase pay for the plastic surgery? Is there some, did they have some law? It was Earl in a lawsuit or Dave in a lawsuit or which, I, I can't tell which one of them they showed. Because they were twins, you know. Yeah, I don't know about any lawsuits. Uh, obviously, there were issues that caused them to be fired for, I think, bootlegging merchandise, but that was a long well, time. Well, which was bullshit, by the way. I don't know anything about it, I, was it? I side with the Hebners. Why? What were they doing? 
Um, I don't know, but I side with them. But, but they, that, they, you, you know. can't say it's bullshit if you don't know. Yeah, well, I heard, but I can't remember. <laughs> well, that's good enough for me. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, defendant will answer the question. Don't make me badger you. Uh, anyway, so they did that deal there. And then, of course, Jack Tunney had said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. So they had the title declared vacant for the tournament at WrestleMania 4, which was against Clash 1. A lot of numerals here. And by the way, that's the Sunday afternoon from Greensboro where we had 7.8 million people, I believe it was, watching the last 15 minutes of Flair and Sting over on the Clash of Champions on TBS 30 six years ago tony uh but but teddy put savage over in the uh, finals of the tournament at wrestlemania and he kind of phrase it well you know the vince was selling uh, the action figures the toys and everything to the kids he needed a hero i i think he was he was going to put it on savage all along anyway well he, you know it just that was what was planned, was it not? Originally, it was supposed to be DiBiase, the story was, and then it was changed because that's when the story goes, Hockey Talk Man was asked to lose the Intercontinental title back to Randy Savage, but he didn't have a contract. So he started talking to Dusty Rhodes, I guess, or someone in that office, with the idea he would show up on TBS with the Intercontinental Championship. Vince made a deal with Hockey, he held the title until SummerSlam, Instead of Savage winning that, he won the tournament that, again, rumor has it, DiBiase was going to win. Ah, so there may be some smoke to that fire, or fire to that smoke, or charcoal, gasoline, something to the story. There could be. There could be. Well, then Ted bought the million dollar belt. So there you go. So he did the the million dollar cha and again i think that probably cost vince more than any other belt that he ever even though it was cubic zirconii that's the plural uh it still it was a lot of work a piece of work and so vince spent more on that belt than probably any other belt he ever bought in history and then you know it, it, once that they established that, the the rest of the show was, well, meanwhile, the wife was taking care of the kids and Ted was always on the road and people mentioned that Ted was partying hard. And then his wife said that she saw charges on the bills that made her catch him cheating. He put his shit on credit cards? Ted, what's this 3500 for hookers? I might not know what a, a, a class act massage servant. What the? How? Uh, Party favors, a.k.a. cocaine. <laughs> what is this? Why'd you charge it, you idiot? I don't know. Unless, I'm Jerry Springer, he got caught when he was the running for fucking governor, right? In Ohio, after he'd been the mayor of Cincinnati, writing checks to the massage parlor. But how do you... Ted, I'm going through the uh, books. I'm trying to get the taxes in order. What's this charge for a late-night pussy? <laughs> it's just... And then, the it says, and then it says everybody has a price. <laughs> What's going on over there? The memo line says get checked on Tuesday. <laughs> what is... <laughs> so somehow... And I, I don't know how, but somehow we've just, this has merely been conjecture on our part, ladies and gentlemen, on how. But his wife saw paying the bills that he had been cheating on her, and they went to counseling with a pastor and apparently got religion. So once again, extreme emotional stress leads to irrational beliefs, and I skipped a lot of this part, just being honest with you. Hey, Ted, someone in your hotel room rented the movie Ass Blasters 5? <laughs> You know anything about this? Are you watching it alone or with Virgil? Wait a minute, Ted. 
I went back and watched Ass Blasters 5. You were in it. Oh! And I was, <laughs> no, and so again, mere extrapolation, ladies and gentlemen, on our part. Speculation only. If necessary, I'll be happy to go back and watch Ass Blasters 5 and make copious <laughs> notes to make sure Ted's not really in it, just so I can clear him of that. But seriously, though, what could she have seen on the credit card statements? Unless it was like, you know, Madam Suck and Fuck. Like, what could what she have of- seen on the statement that would have said Ted's fucking around? Unless it was just dinner for two, it was something that simple. Well, I mean, here's the thing. <laughs> If you, I hate to say this, but if you've given any thought to this whatsoever, have any experience with this type of thing, you're not going to buy any type of present or gift or service for an unauthorized individual and put it on a credit card or some type of paper documentation that your significant other would be examining at a later date Unless you just have completely lost your fucking mind, which has been known to happen. Uh, so, you know, but I hate, to th- I hate to think that Ted would be that sloppy, but apparently something may have taken place. What's it say here on the receipt about sloppy million dollar dream? What was going on that night, Ted? Either, either that or, or, wait a minute, how did you spend $7,000 at Adam and Eve? Yet all I got was this lousy thing from fucking Spencer's gifts. Hey, maybe it's that. Maybe it's gifts. Who'd you buy all this for at Bergdorf? Hey, who? Bergdorf Goodman. It's a famous store. Oh, oh, I I haven't been to Bergdorf's. Bergdorf. I, Bergdorf. Well, it's his place, so it could be. That's a possessive apostrophe s. It belongs to him. Bergdorf's. Well, back to uh, SmackDown. We were, we were, no, back to DiBiase. Back to Ted DiBiase. Basically, after the religion part, they got back to wrestling just to say that he was having neck issues and he decided to retire and managed and announced for a little while and started preaching. And I skipped through the, the, uh, the, the preaching part of the last of the show also. So that's kind of why I was I was dis I wanted to relive some of the glory years Ted DiBiase before he sold out and became the million dollar man and made all that money. But it was a it was a, a decent a decent program. Indeed. What it was. was your final thoughts? No, on I mean, I enjoyed again. I, I joke about it, but leaving out that story when it's happening right now, it's hard to you think this has credibility because of that. It's a very WWE-centric documentary focusing on the things that make Ted happy. <laughs> it seems that's most of these documentaries. If it makes you happy. Oh, God, stop. Not the Sheryl Crow catalog. We've talked about this on like four different occasions. Well, I, just, I just learned the tune of that, though. I just, I was proud. I mean, a big takeaway. I mean, if they wanted to make some money, they could put on. But Amazon. how much is he really? How much is he involved in that? Or is it was it his sons and he caught it, got caught in some blowback and or uh, ancillary heat? I see what's going on. DiBiase got to you. Well, no, I'm asking you. Yeah. Does he have just what was he accused of? Because I know that his sons were. Doing things with ministries and state money, no. and those two things never fucking right. mix well together. But what was Ted actually doing involved in this? They said that, I believe he profited from the whole thing. I want to say it was a beach house or something, and also he slapped the child. Do what now? No, 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 I added that. Just to get your attention. <laughs> no, apparently there was some kind of financial shenanigans and that I believe... And at an old blind lady. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, there was a mansion on the water, as always. A mansion on the water, as opposed to smoke on the water or fire in the sky. I don't. I mean, it's not. It's not goddamn Nightline. It's not a twenty twenty piece. I don't think they're going to talk about his legal issues, except if he had brought it up as part of his wrestling career. You think if they when they bust him for it and they say, "What are all these charges?" He should go back to his old faithful one. I'm cheating on my wife. <laughs> what it was. It was all in the process of having an extramarital affair, and I was trying to... I didn't know anyone was going to look at these statements again. I didn't know this was going to happen. You would think you'd get your uh, paperwork in order after... Uh, well, good good right. story, good documentary. It's amazing how, when you see the photos of him as a child, 
other than like the period in the mid and late eighties where he grew out the facial hair and dyed it kind of blonde, he looks exactly facially now like he did when he was a kid. Like yes. as soon as you see a picture of Ted DiBiase, you know it's him. Yes, and he almost just the uh the cheeks and the eyes and the the overall shape, and he's he's always had a damn fine head of hair. And deceptively big, because he's skinny. He was never big and muscular, like you said earlier, but he's what, six three? Probably at least. Well, yes, but what's your definition of skinny? Now there's there's a, a ways in there between not muscular and skinny. He's he's always been, I think, two forty, two fifty. And he is six foot three. He's a big guy. He just look at he looked like it next to the other guys that were that yeah. same size, but they were all bulked up. Even when he was on the gas in WWE, he never got bulked up like that. Yeah, well, and sometimes, you know, it, it it's not there. You can be in you can be in go shape better than show shape if you she what I'm saying. Well, speaking of the shape of things as well as uh People's personal affairs will be reviewing the Paul Heyman biography on the drive thru Yes, as I mentioned, because I want to give it some attention, because I want to I want to try to see if I can get any insight into what makes Happy Heyman tick. This is one I, I want to sit down. I didn't want to be interrupted for an hour over, but uh, you know the thing about about DiBiase, they showed the uh, the modern stuff, the stuff he's doing now. He's preaching. He's preaching to small rooms. Brian, he's preaching. He's in in person, not the big crowds that he was that he was in front of in the stadiums, not the you know the major tens of thousands of people and millions that he that he was addressing on television. But he's down here. He's just speaking to a few people. I wonder if Ted should set up some kind of of online presence to sell the religion to the folks. A platform, if you will, where he could get online and and instead of standing there in front of 24 people, well, he could be standing out there in front of 20 billion people all around the world if he yeah. just had the platform to sell the product and service that he's trying to sell to the people. Don't tell my wife dot com. That's it. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have something like that. That you don't want your wife to find out <laughs> Something about. Something like what? Jim? If you've got, if, <laughs> no, if you've got something like that, if you've got a product or a service or a line of horseshit that you want to sell to people around the world for good, honest money, that they will pay you for your product or good or service or whatever the case may be, and you need the platform. Which to launch this drivel, I mean launch this golden opportunity out to the world, that's where you need our friends at Shopify, don't you, Brian? I think the average person out there with their business looking for a good online solution for commerce needs Shopify. I don't know about this specific example or whether they would want to be associated with it. Well, I agree with many of the words that you just uttered. Because Shopify is oh. the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Now, every stage, there could be up stages and down stages. Now, a lot of people, they just want to get you and upstage you. But these people, they will get you and downstage you too. They're going to stick with you every stage of the way. And they're going to take in money. And they're going to they're gonna send you a good part of it. I'll tell you that right now. Because Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. That means they're they're closing, they are already one-tenth of a monopoly. So think about this. When they are the global force behind the platforms and all the major online retailers, and they already have millions of other entrepreneurs across 175 countries, when they've wrapped this whole thing up and you're not involved, well, you're going to be fucked. Because they're going to remember you. Everybody that is not doing business with Shopify right now, they're making a list. And I'll guarantee no, you. No, you don't guarantee anything. When they've wrapped up 99% of all the e-commerce in the world and you're getting squeezed, I mean, they're squeezing your neck until your britches are full. That's how tight it is. 
You'll wish that you had come crawling to Shopify when they were willing to deal with you instead of what's going to happen to you now. So right well, now, folks. Well, let's just talk in positive in yes. positive ways, in a positive manner. Hey, your business needs help. Shopify is there to help it. They can help you. How's that Yeah. Doing? Well, they can help in a variety of ways. They can make it easier on you or they can make it harder on you. And you get to pick which one. And the choice is easy. You, I'm telling you, it's, it's like, you know, if you've got some great idea, Shopify can turn that idea into reality because they can develop things all along the way, not only the websites, but also the best converting checkout on the internet. It's up to 36% better compared to shit that doesn't work. And they can, again, lead you through this every step of the way. Shopify Collective, curating products from brands you love. The Shopify Bundles app, where you can sell bundles of shit to people for no apparent reason. Just put shit together and sell it. Doesn't have to be any rhyme or reason. But they'll there show be. you how to do that. There should be a rhyme or reason if you want to sell it. Well, and they've got Shopify magic, so they're just pulling shit out of thin air. Out of but hat. you can find out all about it, folks, at Shopify.com. That's what you can do. And, like I said, get in good with them now, because later on it could be rough on you. You know, if you're just one of the little guys when they've taken over completely, and then they will control the horizontal, they'll control the vertical. They will be. They a, will control all you see and hear. They will be a fine, reputable business who operates up and above any. Up, pro, up just, and away. They're wonderful people. Use them today for your business. Banging on tables, loud noises, and words. Shopify is there for you. Yes, because businesses that grow grow with Shopify. Did you just say Spotify? Shopify, Shopify, Shopify. Sign up for a $1 a month trial period right now at shopify.com slash JCE. That's all lowercase, the JCE. Some, for some reason that matters. They've said this many times. And, but that's the thing, a dollar a month trial period. Well, for uh, how in the world can you possibly, what are you going to ask for a refund on a dollar a month? You can't afford the sales tax. What's your problem, Pismo? Go to Shopify.com slash JCE right now. $1 a month trial period. You can see all of the things they can do for you and how they can put you under their protective umbrella like a big brother watching over you, controlling your movements like a puppet master, everything you say and do, the air that you breathe, this... You'll become a brood mare for the state. It's all under one umbrella. Shopify.com slash JCE. No matter what stage you're in.